Part of me by that point knew that I had to eat meat. And we had that conversation with my husband at home. He said, you've got to start eating meat. I think that will solve the problem. But I'd be so fatigued, I couldn't really move out of bed. We'd go out, we'd do our workout, morning workout, and I'd come back home and I'd crash. On my birthday, literally two, when I was four, so two years ago on my birthday, I had my first bite of bacon. And that's how it started. It's incredibly difficult to replicate a normal working pancreas, right? However, if you're going to play a game, if I'm going to play this game, then I'd rather play a game that I have a chance of winning. And I feel that by eliminating processed foods and carbohydrates from my diet, I figured out a way to, to win this game. Good morning, everyone. Today we have with us Nairi Massinian, and I hope I got that pronounced correctly. How are you today? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? It's good I'm to good. be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Where are you at again? Remind me where you're located. I'm in the UK, and I recently shared the dinner table with you at the PHC conference. That's right. Yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> that was a couple months ago. I guess for those that aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, I have a linguistics background and I've worked in the education sector for close to 30 years before taking early retirement from that sector and 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 shifting into nutrition research. I I currently work as a coach, nutrition coach at Low Carbon Fasting. I also host a Low Carbon Fasting YouTube channel. And I research particularly type 1 diabetes because I'm type 1 diabetic, and I run a few type 1 diabetes groups on Facebook. Okay. Like I said, you've got definitely got so-called skin in the game on the topic you're researching. And uh, let me ask you, how did you evolve from the linguistic side to what propelled you into doing nutrition research and maybe the diagnosis of type? How long have you been a type 1 diabetic, and did that propel you into doing this research? <laughs> I've been a type 1 diabetic for 45 years now. I, I did it for my own health reasons. And the deeper I went into it, the more I re realized how little I knew. And so I was eager to learn to improve my own health. And I, I actually had a good think about that because I loved teaching. It was my passion. And I thought I can't do both. And I'm also, I also have a translation agency. So I'm the co-founder and director of the tra translation agency as well. So I couldn't fit everything in. So I retired from teaching and I now work, run my agency, translation agency, and I do full-time research and coaching. What in it just, just Forgive me to ask about this. I know it's a little bit, maybe not what we're going to talk about most of it, but when you say translation, you're translating obviously into different languages. What languages are you working with? We started with French to English, and now the company's grown bigger, and we now cover 16 languages, and we mainly translate into English. Okay. So take other texts from other languages and translate back into English for, uh, yeah, because a lot of us are English natives that we're not exposed to all this other <laughs> literature that's out there. And there's a lot of it written in other languages in particular, some of we're probably missing out on quite a bit. All right. So you've been a diabetic, a type one diabetic for 45 years. So most of your life, I would assume. And what, when did you make this low carb and decide I wanted to get into nutrition research? What prompted that? It was 2015, and I have no idea. I don't recall what I was looking for on YouTube, but I stumbled upon one of Jason Fung's videos on diabetes and blood sugars and his analogy of storing excess glucose in the liver. He he compared that to freezer, the freezer that we never access. <laughs> and it just clicked to me. It just all made sense. And then I watched another and another video, and I thought, I'm going to lower my carbs. As a responsible type 1 diabetic, who was basically binging on carbs because I was eating healthy carbs. I was always a healthy, sort of health conscious person, but I was primarily eating carbs because I was vegetarian. And so my diet consisted of 80% uh, carbohydrates. I decided to lower my carbohydrates straight away, but I also knew that I would have to lower my insulin. I'd have to adjust my insulin dose. And so that's how it started in 2015. And I retired from teaching in 20, 
21, a couple of years ago. Okay. So you're coming from a vegetarian background, lots of carbohydrates. So just as a frame of reference, how much insulin were you typically using at that time? I think at that time, I must have been using something like 30 to 40 total units of insulin per day. And now on a protein-heavy diet, I'm no longer vegetarian, I'm using between 20 and 23. Okay, so almost half, maybe a 40% reduction or something like that. So that's... Is there, do you feel that there's an advantage to using less insulin overall? Is it just, if your blood glucose is controlled, does it matter if you're using more or less? What are your thoughts on that? That's an interesting question because every type of diabetic I talk to, we all approach insulin completely differently. And I'm not just talking about type ones, regular type ones out there, but also type 1 MDs, type 1, or physicians who treat type 1 diabetics, we have different approaches to insulin. So yes, my goal is not to unnecessarily increase insulin levels, not to be too insulin dependent. But at the same time, I also have come to realize that I actually need insulin for protein, quite a good amount of insulin for protein. And so in that context, and in the context of strength training, because I also do a strength training, I no longer look at insulin as the enemy. So lowering insulin is not my primary goal at the moment. My primary goal, of course, there are a few goals as a type 1 diabetic, but my primary goal now is to actually reduce blood sugar fluctuations on a daily basis. And just... Have you been able to successfully do it? How, what is your, because they talk about time and range and glucose variability. How much fluctuation do you have now with this protein heavy, lower carb approach versus maybe a high carb vegetarian approach? What's been the difference with that aspect? Okay, Dr. Baker, I'd love to come back here in a year's time and tell you I've cracked it all. So I'm I'm perfect at it now. It was incredibly challenging to work out how much insulin protein required because there are so many different recommendations and none of them seemed to work for me initially. I tried different things and it didn't work. So I have recently figured out how to dose for protein because the insulin that I'm using in my pump, I wear an insulin pump, is rapid acting insulin. And so rapid acting insulins came about in the 1990s, early 90s to cover carbohydrates. They're designed to cover because they rapid acting. And so they're supposed to prevent quick blood sugar rises as a result of heavy carb, carb meals, right? And so I'm still using rapid acting insulin, but I have to use my rapid acting insulin Very smartly, obviously, I can't just dose myself five big units of insulin because I've had steak, because the blood sugar rise from a steak is going to take about four to five hours, whereas rapid acting insulin is just going to crash me within an hour. And But I don't have any other insulin. That's all I have. So I had to figure out a way to make it work for protein. And now what I do is I I wear a CGM. So I've recently switched to Dexcom from Freestyle Libre. So I check my blood sugars and see which way I'm trending after I've eaten my meal. And then accordingly and intermittently bolus a small amount, micro doses of insulin over a period of four hours to cover my protein meal. Yeah, there's some people that I've talked to a lot of type one diabetics, and some people get around that issue by using an older insulin, regular insulin, not the synthetic, which has a slower onset and maybe a longer duration. And have you ever considered doing that? I guess it's not pump compatible, perhaps. I'm not sure. I have considered the R insulin, the intermediate sort of acting insulin. I've last time I asked my consultant here, um, he wasn't keen on it. So he said, You're doing a good job. He was doing a good job. He just dismissed it. And I was desperate to get it. I was even inquiring to see if I could just purchase it myself out of pocket. But now that I've figured out a way to use rapid acting insulin to cover my protein rises, I don't necessarily want to shift to to regular insulin or our insulin. Yeah, I, fair I, enough. I, you're doing I'm making pump. it work for me. So, 
you're doing it through a pump. You're not having to inject yourself multiple times after a meal with the, the rapid. So you said that, let me ask you this. One of the concerns around diabetes, we're concerned about glucose variability, but ultimately we're really concerned about are the complications that they induce eyesight issues, retinopathy, blindness, vascular issues, ultimately leading to things like amputations, kidney disease, brain injuries, heart disease. How are are you, I don't know how old you are, but how are, how are you monitoring those things? And have you seen improvements, reversals, no, pro, no progress towards disease with those things? I'm 50 now. So I was diagnosed at age five. So diabetic for 45 years. I'm 50 now. So I'm probably lucky because I don't have severe diabetes complications. So I don't have retinopathy or neuropathy or, or heart disease or kidney disease for that matter. And I think that's primarily due to not my recent efforts since 2015 to lower my carbohydrates and to be as close to carnivore as possible very recently. I think it's primarily down to how my mother fed me when I was a child. I was five years old. And interestingly, I was, I grew up in the Middle East and the recommendation then in the 1970s, late 70s, even throughout the 1980s was lower carbohydrate diet for all type ones. They didn't label it as lower carbohydrate necessarily, but I remember the sheet my mother was given at diagnosis and it had rice and pastas and breads in the very limited list. And it had sugar in the big no-no list. And then egg, eggs and meat and cheese, all of those came in the OK list and as well as lower carbohydrate vegetables. So that's how my mother raised me. I remember the daily portions of meat she'd feed me. And I remember cakes, for example, being just the birthday thing. I only had cake when it was my birthday. That's why I vividly remember every single birthday cake because it was indeed a treat. So all meals were cooked at home. I was never fed junk food. So I think the reason I don't suffer after 45 years of di diabetes from any severe complications is down to, to the diet that I grew up on. And then at 19, of course, I decided to be a vegetarian and I moved to the UK to study and I found out there is rapid acting insulin and that carbohydrates did not need to be limited. And I thought I was coming from some old world and that doctors in, middle, in the Middle East, they knew nothing. And I just welcomed this, oh, eat anything you want sort of recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> and we're seeing that again with, we just see that played out over and over again, just eat whatever, do whatever you want. You don't know responsibility. We got a drug for it. And this, we see that with the things like the semaglutide, semaglutide rather, the ozempics and stuff like that. So ah, just eat whatever you want. We'll just load you up on drugs. So, so you, so 19, you're 50 now, 2015. So that's eight years ago or so. So from 19 through early forties, you were eating just kind of whatever, whatever you want. As a vegetarian, you're probably still making some attempt to, to not eat a lot of junk, I assume, correct? So I was vegetarian with intermittent sort of periods of veganism because I thought that would be the better option, but I couldn't sustain it. So <laughs> I kept switching back to vegetarianism and including dairy, which I'm glad I did because on a vegan diet, I was, I was poorly, I was sick. I was literally sick, but I was vegetarian vegan for 30 years. So from 19 to, to no, 49, I would say I was eating, I was a healthy vegan, but I was taking no supplementation because I had no understanding of, of nutrition. I didn't understand the importance of protein. And when I was much younger in my early 20s, I remember having fights with my mother because my mother would say something like protein is important for you. You must eat protein. And I would fight that, say something like something stupid as you, as you do in your early 20s. There are a lot of people, like hundreds and thousands of people in the world who, uh, who eat vegetarian diets. So if they're doing it, then, you know, I can too. And you can get all your nutrients from a vegetarian diet. But I didn't understand you nutrition until my health suffered. And I couldn't figure out why I was suffering. My blood sugars were good. It was 20, end of 2020s. My blood sugars were doing really great on a low carbohydrate diet. 
I was no longer eating homemade breads and homemade pastas. So I'd switched to lower carbohydrate diet. I was eating plenty of eggs, like six egg omelets. I was eating dairy on a daily basis, but I couldn't work out why I was so fatigued. I had no energy. And then, of course, the first thing is, is as a low carber, you think, okay, so my fuel source isn't enough, isn't sufficient. Because my carbs were super low by that point, I thought I had to increase my fat. So I tried increasing my fat. I'd even put fat in my coffee in the mornings. That didn't do it for me. So it definitely wasn't the fat. I experimented with everything. So I started taking supplements. For, okay, so a whole list of supplements from B-complex to desiccated liver. B-complex, desiccated liver are the ones I'm thinking of. And all the vitamins like D, C, zinc, iodine. Iodine is mineral, obviously. I even took selenium. I, I was taking a whole bunch of supplements. Part of me by that point knew that I had to eat meat. And we had that conversation with my husband at home. He said, you've got to start eating meat. I think that will solve the problem. But I'd be so fatigued, I couldn't really move out of bed. We'd go out, we'd do our workout, morning workout, and I'd come back home and I'd crash. And it was only a few years before that I would actually have good sort of sustain myself and stand on my feet at school teaching a bunch of children. And I just couldn't figure out what happened to me. It seemed like overnight it, my, my body changed and I avoided eating meat. I knew I had to start eating meat, but I thought maybe supplements would work. I tried that and they made very little difference. And, and then it was around that same time that I realized I'm probably not absorbing the nutrients from the vegetables I'm eating because I was on a low carbohydrate diet. I was only eating eggs and a large amount of vegetables, but I realized those vegetables, they're giving me digestion problems and I'm probably not absorbing the nutrients fully from the vegetables. And that was such a shame because I grew those vegetables in, in London, in my backyard, in London, out of all places where we barely see the sun. But I actually put a lot of effort into growing my own organic vegetables that I could no longer enjoy. So I knew that it was time for change. So on my birthday, literally two, when I was four, so two years ago on my birthday, I had my first bite of bacon. <laughs> And that's how it started. That's a slippery slope that bacon is for sure. Did you think about anemia at any point? You're talking about fatigue and I'm just wondering, and there's a very big, obviously a significant difference between a vegan diet where there's no animal products and a vegetarian diet where you can eat lots of eggs and dairy and you can get maybe a little more, certainly a better quality protein in many cases. And you're right. I think a lot of people, they're able to lose weight on these heavy plant-based diets, but they're not, in many cases, they're not absorbing much nutrition. So it's kind of just kind of like a starvation diet in some regards. Did did anemia, was anemia ever a part of the picture that you no, knew of? I didn't have anemia. I didn't have anemia, but, but I, so that was another thing. And also as a type one diabetic, I get my thyroids checked regularly. So I didn't have that. I didn't have celiac disease, but then that, I didn't eat gluten anyway. What else did they check, test me for? So they tested me for a few other diseases that commonly occur with diabetics and I didn't seem to have any of those, but I realized it was nutritional deficiencies. I just wasn't absorbing the nutrients fully from the vegetables. And I couldn't digest. My, my tummy would be so bloated. And it was such an uncomfortable feeling that I would have, I would have wanted to give them up had it been easy to eat meat, but it wasn't easy to start eating meat. So I had to start with very small portions and force myself to to eat more and more i would the first bite of bacon was actually only a quarter of a full bacon and it was fried so it was all crispy and my husband crumbled it into tiny <laughs> pieces he crumbled it almost like potato chips and put it put it mix it in into my eggs into my omelet and even that was a struggle for me after 30 years but gradually i i started feeling better and I realized, wow, the missing link for me was actually red meat. That was the missing link. 
Interesting. Yeah. Did you, in the course of your, you said you, you do a lot of research with regard to this, whether to help yourself or to help other people out. Oh, I wasn't going to ask you. So you're having all these digestive problems, bloating, pain, gas. Was there ever a physician involved? And do they ever mention, hey, there's a reason for this? Or do they try to normalize it? Because a lot of people we hear out there, I see a lot of people, particularly social media, people talking about their bloated stomachs, particularly women, and saying, well, it's just normal. We should ex- accept it, embrace it. And I just don't think it is. What do you, was that ever norm, tried to be normalized for you? Or did you just think this is normal digestion? I knew it wasn't normal. And uh, I'd given up opening up to my physicians because when I'd mentioned that I was lowering my carbohydrates to my diabetes consultant, for example, just two years prior to introducing meat or a few years prior to that, I was dismissed. And I was told, in fact, I was literally told, you're still young, Nairi. So if you're going to have another baby, you must start eating carbs. And I came home and I spent good like eight hours reading every, reading all the literature on fertility and uh, and carbohydrates. And I found that the opposite was true. And in fact, there there were fertility clinics in the United States all over the place that were treating their patients by lowering their carbohydrates first and and addressing the insulin resistance. So I just decided not to open up to them. Um, I was doing it on my own. I knew I had to be, I had to do this alone. And the community, online community wasn't as big back then. 2015, 2017 even, it wasn't as big back then. And a lot of things I would read online wouldn't necessarily apply to a type 1 diabetic because now we have the additional challenge of having to adjust insulin and monitor our blood sugars more closely. So I knew I had to be in control of my own health and I had to be, I had to do it alone. As I said, I was feeling better and better when I was eating meat and uh, and gradually I started reducing the vegetables and eating meat. So now I would say I don't like putting percentages so for about three days a week, full carnivore. I don't eat any vegetables. On the other days, I may have an avocado or half an avocado or just a piece of tomato or some cucumbers with my meat. Yeah. And, and as far as, I guess, I, I assume you have an endocrinologist or somebody that's me- prescribing the insulin that you require. Have you had discussions r- with that person about nutrition? Has that ever come up? No, nutrition didn't come up with my endo and we call them diabetes consultants here in the UK. So nutrition didn't come up. But I do remember when I was I'm going back now, 18 years, 19 years, when I was pregnant, I remember that was one of the, and I was still vegetarian when I was pregnant. I remember asking my endo, as you would call them, if I should make any changes or if I should take any multivitamins, for example, because I said very clearly, I'm vegetarian, vegan, occasionally I eat cheese, but that's about it. And I was told, in fact, there was a diabetes specialist nurse present as well in the pregnancy clinic. And I was told, no, you seem to be doing okay. And you're you're eating homemade meals. Don't worry about any vitamins. I wish I knew better back then. <laughs> However. Let's see. As far as you're, you said, you know, you're carnivore three days a week. You're, you added a couple of vegetables on the other days. How hard has that been for you to sustain? Because some people say that it's not sustainable and, and you need to eat you need to eat a lot of carbs and you need to take a lot of insulin to, to cover that. Has it been difficult for you to sustain? To sustain in terms of my diabetes, oh, it's very easily sustainable. What I love about eating this way is that my blood sugar fluctuations on a daily basis are minimal. I literally stay 90% of the time. I stay between between 70 and 108. That's my range. And that's a very tight range. 70, sometimes 80% of the time, I stay within that range. There is no way that I would have been able to do this on a carbohydrate-based diet. No way. There's just no way you could do that. But that's not to say it was easy to get here. I had to work out how to use rapid acting insulin, which is designed to cover carbohydrates, but to use rapid acting for protein, as I was mentioning at the beginning, it was difficult 
to crack the code, if you like. But I seem to have worked it out now. So it's working for me and I am not considering changing my insulin type, the type of insulin I'm taking at this moment in time. So I'm not considering that. With those numbers, you know, and I know you use different numbers in the UK, but thanks for converting it for us, 70 to 108, that the diabetes consultant or what we call an endocrinologist here would have to say, hey, that's unusually good control because most type ones are nowhere near there. One's eating carbohydrates. Has he ever, he or she ever commented on, hey, look, what great control you have? No, but the comments I've received from them are that I'm too, my, my range is too tight and I'm putting too much of an effort into control, into tight, keeping blood sugars in tight control. And so I've had no encouragement. In fact, just yesterday, I switched from a Freestyle Libre sensor, which is the one I was using for seven years. Just yesterday, I switched to Dexcom G6. And I was on the phone. We used to go to the diabetes clinic, local clinic, and there would be several diabetics. And we used to be to, we used to receive the training on how to use a new device. They're no longer doing that because of COVID or whatever, or staff shortages. So it was literally on the phone. I was with a diabetes nurse for two hours trying to switch. And she was telling me where to set my high blood sugar alarm and low blood sugar alarm. And when I said to her, okay, so my high blood sugar al alarm is 6.7, which is 120. So I want the Dexcom to actually alarm above that point. And she said, oh, but it will be beeping all day long. I said, but it doesn't because I don't really go <laughs> above 6.7 or above 120 too often. So she said, oh no, do consider that. Just, just put 10 because that's the normal. 10 is 180. I said, yes. And I don't create conflicts. I don't argue. I just said, yes, okay. And I just moved on. I did what I know is best for me. So we the, the guidelines aren't any different here from from what in the United States or in Canada, we're very much the same. They just want you to have your range between 70 and 100, 180. And that's between four and four and uh, four and 10 in our measurements. And feel good about yourself and about your health. There's nothing healthy about having blood sugars fluctuate in that range. Yeah. It boggles the mind that someone would say your control is too good and that particularly if you're not having a lot of hypos because one of the concerns is hey maybe you're having a lot of hypoglycemia and therefore there's consequences of that down the road potentially but it doesn't sound like you're having a lot of that either correct no and i'm not having too many hypos because i'm lucky i wear the cgm so it would alarm me when i'm dropping low it would alarm me but the good thing about it is that as i said if my meals are based on protein and I'm taking micro doses of insulin, not large doses that would eventually make me crash, but micro doses intermittently, maybe say every 40 minutes over a period of four hours. There's very small margin of error there, right? It's a, that's a very different way to manage your blood sugars than to take seven or 10 units of rapid acting insulin all in one go and then just crash an hour later. So that's why I don't have symptomatic. And I feel I have to mention this because there's hypo and there's hypo. There's something called symptomatic hypo where you would need someone's assistance to save you from a hypoglycemic sort of event. And there's hypo that you become aware of, like something like 3.8, for example. All, all CGMs classify at 3.8, which is something like 68, right? 60, 65, 68 as a hypo. But that's not a symptomatic hypo. That's not the kind of hypo you should be worrying, worrying about. So I don't worry about those kind of hypos. So if I do drop below four or below 70, it's usually down to 68, maybe 67. And then I quickly come back up again. My aim is to hover at 100, which is five. So if I can just stay there, um, stay there, then I'll be happy. No, actually five is 90 in your measurements. If I can just stay at 90 all day long, I would be happy. That's my target. So if I'm below, I try to correct myself to bring me up to 90. And if I'm higher, again, I take a microdose of insulin to bring me down to five or 19 year measurements. 
As far as how you feel, because I've heard people say that when they go on a carnivore or a similar diet and they're type one diabetic, they sometimes will say, I don't feel like I'm diabetic anymore. I don't have the, you know, obviously you know, hypoglycemia is, can be very distressing to people that they've never experienced. It is quite miserable place to be sweaty, confused, hung, starving, not a good place to be. And then the hyperglycemia also can have problems. It can make you sleepy and tired and all these things. Did you, do you feel any different now with the better control? Does it make it, can you tell that I feel better? I feel better because eating this way gives you hope because when you address the biggest factor that impacts blood sugar. I'm not saying diet is the only factor. There are other factors like perimenopause. And I'm not perimenopausal. I'm having to figure new things out. And that's yet another challenge added to to my type one. However, diet has the largest impact on blood sugars. And once you address the diet, then then it changes your outlook towards diabetes. Then you just start thinking, I'm in control of this. I can control it. It doesn't mean you won't ever make mistakes. You won't ever have hypers, small hypers and small hypos, but they're not severe. They're not dramatic hypers and hypos. Dr. Bernstein calls this a game of small numbers. You're still playing a game because you're trying to manually, manually inject yourself and control your blood sugars it's incredibly difficult to replicate a normal working pancreas, right? However, if you're going to play a game, if I'm going to play this game, then I'd rather play a game that I have a chance of winning. And I feel that by eliminating processed foods and carbohydrates from my diet, I figured out a way to win this game. Yeah, you mentioned the importance of protein, and I, like you, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of protein. I think I think most people under eat it. In fact, a lot of people, there's a lot of people, particularly in the plant based world, says there's no such thing as protein deficiency. It's overstated, and yet if you look like a country like India, something like ninety percent of the Indian population, irrespective of wealth, even the wealthy Indians do not get enough protein, even to meet the, to meet the US RDA, which is abysmally small in the first place. It's, so we do see people that are, I think, suffering from the ills of not enough protein. How has protein upping your protein impacted you quality of life wise, body composition wise, just in general? I'm more efficient at building muscle now. And I like that because on my vegetarian diet, I was clearly protein deficient. There's only so many eggs one can eat a day, right? (laughs) And it just wasn't sufficient for me because once I understood the importance of protein and I'd started eliminating the vegetables because I was having unbearable digestive issues, I knew I had to eat more than eggs. And if you think about eggs, the six grams of protein in each egg, yes, you get all the micronutrients and eggs are superfood in my opinion. However, they're not the greatest source of protein unless you eat tons of eggs. But that's difficult because what I do, what works better for my type 1 diabetes is is one meal a day. So I have my one meal around 1 or 2 p.m. so that I've dealt with all my microdosing and I've covered the protein long before I go to sleep. So when I go to sleep, I'm not dealing with food and having to bolus for food. So this one meal a day which isn't necessarily ideal for everyone, especially women, but it seems to work for me. However, I do make an effort to actually eat my protein requirement of the day in that one meal, which if it's challenging for you, don't do it. However, I make it work for me. So I do eat all my protein in one meal. And then four four hours later, sometimes six hours later, I'm done. I've dealt with all the insulin that it needs. And I can have a restful sleep. So I so I think the challenge with protein with one meal a day is that most people don't get enough protein in their one meal. But for me, I seem to be getting, I seem to be doing it. Now I'm eating, I eat steak and something else on the steak and eggs or bacon and eggs, or mostly it's steak and I don't eat bacon that much. I'm getting all my protein in one meal. It's it gives me the strength to continue resistance training. And it's very important for me to actually start building muscle because I was muscle muscle deficient, protein deficient, muscle deficient is another way to, to describe it because I was hopelessly skinny 
And I had no no strength for years. I couldn't lift a two kilogram weight from the floor. And I had abdominal fat. So all of these things have been resolved now on a high protein diet. I'm able to actually build muscle. And as a type 1 diabetic, struggle with that. Even at my age, I'm building muscle. I'm lifting weights. And I have healed from my frozen shoulders just through dietary changes. And of course, regular workouts, but, but no steroid injections. Just. To clarify, when you say I get all my protein requirements within one meal, what do you consider your protein requirements? Maybe how much you're trying to get per gram of body weight or kilogram of body weight or pound of body weight. Do you know what that is? About 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilo of my body weight. So I'm getting Yeah, that's inconsistent with guys like Don Lehman and and others that'll talk about that as far as being requirements. And I I similarly eat a lot of protein in one meal and I get, I easily consume 200, 250 grams in a meal, which is not challenging for me at all, but yeah, but I do get it. And I think that's important and wise to point out that not everybody can eat that much protein in one setting. Some people just need a couple more meals. Now you'd mentioned you've done a lot of fasting or talked a lot about fasting. How has that impacted your type one journey? And do you still employ, obviously you're eating one meal a day, so you're intermittent fasting, but how important is that aspect of it? Obviously I'm doing intermittent fasting daily, about 23 hours of fasting. And then my meal would last about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, sometimes an hour. It depends because it's not easy to eat that much protein in one sitting. So I just sit down and I take my time and I re- re- reply to my emails. I just, if the family's around, I sit down with the family. I take my time and slowly I'll eat. So I'm intermittent. I'm doing intermittent fasting for 23 hours every day. The benefit of it is that, so after I've eaten my meal for about four hours, I'm still dealing with blood sugar fluctuations, four to six hours. Beyond that, my blood sugar stays in a, it just flatlines for the rest of the time. And so I don't want to have to do that twice or even three times a day to have to deal with a meal. And if it is protein-based, then I'm going to have to deal with it for good three hours after I eat. And by the time you've dealt with it, it's time to eat your second meal. If it works for people, then it's great. But for me, it wouldn't work. So I like dealing with my meal protein and the blood sugar fluctuations for four hours after I've eaten. And then the rest of the time, I'm flatlining. I'm literally flatlining. It doesn't even budge. So that's why I like it. However, I've also done extended fasts with type 1 diabetes. I did a 90-hour fast, and then I thought I'd break my own record and do a 100-hour fast, which is 100 hours is just, just not quite five days, but close to five days. And I wrote detailed blogs on my website about what I experienced and ketone levels and blood sugars, blood sugar charts and everything. And the reason for that was that I was reading about fasting. Jason Funk's group on fasting. I was a member in the group. I was reading about the benefits of fasting and autophagy and everything. And I thought, I want to try this too. And, and of course, there was data or literature coming out about insulin sensitivity, fasting, making you insulin sensitive. I thought, I really want to do this. And I joined every fasting group on Facebook. I remember <laughs> this was in 2020. And I just wanted to find other type 1 diabetics who'd done it, who'd done extended fasts and, and perhaps share tips with them. And I couldn't find anyone. I couldn't find anyone. I thought, Okay, so I'll create a group on Facebook for type 1s who might be interested in doing extended fasts. And if one person joins, at least that's one person to support me because I'm just going to do it regardless. And so this is, so I did it because everyone in every group told me, no, you shouldn't be looking out for people for type ones who are doing extended fasting. That's very dangerous. Every, In fact, I was threatened to be kicked out of groups when I was trying to find type ones who were doing fasting. And I thought, I'll just create my own group and share my blog. And, and now there are close to 500 crazy type ones who are doing fasting in, in that group. And we share tips and we motivate each other. 
Dr. Baker, you'd be interested in this because I was told it's very dangerous for type 1s to do extended fasts. And, and I started searching for literature to support that. I couldn't find anything. In fact, the main concern was hypoglycemic ep episodes. But of course, I was going to, to do it safely and reduce my insulin accordingly. I already had a CGM. So I had a good tool to monitor my blood sugars over 24 hours. Another fear was fear of ketoacidosis. So if you reduce your insulin too much and your blood sugars rise in a short period of time, you could easily fall into diabetic DKA, which is fatal and fair enough, but I was going to do this very safely. I couldn't find any convincing sort of reasons out there to stop me from doing it. So I thought, why are they telling me you can't do it because you're type one? And I thought, I'm going to show them that I can do it. And I did it. My 90 hour fast went beautifully. And I was so encouraged. Then I did a hundred hour fast. And what I noticed that I was only requiring not my usual 20 units of insulin, but about 12 to 14 units of insulin for good three months after my extended fast. Now that's a win for me. That's a yeah. big reduction in insulin. So if so, it definitely makes you insulin sensitive. I haven't done another one since then. It's qu quite challenging with the per perimenopause, with the hormones. I think it's quite challenging now. Every time I set, <laughs> set my mind to it, I just break my fast at 36 hours. But, but regardless, I showed the world that it can be done. It can be done safely. Yeah, I think with the additional monitoring tools that you have, and I think one of the one of the concerns is just, if just some random person that has very little insight eating a high carb diet that says, "Hey, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue my normal insulin dosages and fast for several days," they could get themselves into problems with hypoglycemia, obviously. And so, I think maybe that's some of the current. But I think with education, it can probably be done relatively safely for many people like that. Now, the question I have is the reason one, one would want to do this as a type one diabetic, because we know that without insulin, for instance, our, we break down, our muscles break down. We just, we just basically catabolize everything. And the insulin is helping prevent muscle breakdown to some degree. There is, that is a concern is like, aren't you worried about losing some of the muscle, the harder muscle that you built, because it takes a lot of work to build muscle and then to have it dissolve to persort, to support blood sugar may be problematic. Now, if you got a lot of excess body fat, maybe you preferentially lose that, then that's maybe that's a net win. But thoughts on muscle preservation around fasting? I took photographs of myself because that was another concern actually that came, came about that with extended fast you're likely to lose muscle mass. And muscle is precious for me. I didn't have muscle mass for years and years as a vegan or vegetarian. I knew how valuable it was to not only build muscle, but to preserve the muscle that I'd built. So from my photographs, I can see that after the five days, on the fifth day, I'd lost some muscle mass. The good thing was that within a week of resistance training, I was back to how exactly how I was before I started the fast. So I thought if I were ever to do this again, I'm not going to worry about muscle loss because it will come back. I have no idea when they talk about in the exercise world, they talk about muscle memory, that your muscles will remember how hard <laughs> they used to work. I wasn't doing resistance training, by the way, during my fast. So so I'd eliminate that because that would have an impact on my blood sugars. I thought I, I want to eliminate everything and just focus on insulin management. But within a week, all my muscles came back. They were right there. I was exactly looking exactly the same as, <laughs> as I looked before my fast. Let me, you know, because you talk about food by consuming one meal a day, it simplifies things because you're not having to continue to dose for every single meal you're doing. So you only have to do it once a day. So it's greatly simplifies some of that stuff. But what about some of the other things that impact glucose or insulin requirement, glucose numbers and insulin requirements like exercise, intense exercise, moderate exercise, things like that. Maybe you get a cold or something like that, or you've got an illness. And a lot of times we'll see this stress hyperglycemia that occurs. How do you manage with those types of things that might come up? Stress will definitely raise blood sugars. So a disrupted sleep, for example. And I used to have disrupted sleeps when my blood sugars would be roller coastering <laughs> all through the night. So I no longer have disrupted sleep. So that's uh, eating this way 
has that advantage too. You can sleep better. And also because I don't have late night meals. So when I go to bed, my body's not heating and trying to digest that protein. That would make me very uncomfortable. Stress definitely has an impact on blood sugars. And I try to eliminate stress as much as I can, primarily by prioritizing my sleep. Sleep is important. I don't compromise that. Now, exercise also has an impact. And I know that some type 1 diabetics prefer not to do any exercise because they don't want to deal with the blood sugar rises uh, or drops. However, for overall health, I don't think that's wise. I'm not, I don't judge anyone. Of course, everyone can make their own decisions. But I, I, for example, if I'm walking, I walk to the gym. And if the walk is long enough, uh, over half an hour, I'm going to drop. And I anticipate that. So if I know I'm going to drop, I suspend my insulin pump. So it doesn't deliver any insulin to me for about 30 minutes. And that normalizes my blood sugar usually. However, when I'm doing resistance training, and it's usually moderate, moderately strenuous or moderate, it just switches back and forth from moderate to moderately strenuous. I almost always will, I always will have a rise, blood sugar rise. And if I don't take extra insulin for it, it could easily rise to, I tried it one day and I regretted it rose up to 17777, 9.8 in our measurements. That's actually normal for as per ADA guidelines. 100, 180 is normal. It's normal range as per ADA guidelines. But I just, I was horrified to see my blood sugar at 9.8. So now I take one unit of insulin before I start working out. And then that keeps my blood sugar at normal range while I'm working out. And then I have to walk back from the gym. And when I'm walking back, I usually suspend my insulin pump because now I know my blood sugar is going to drop. And that one unit of insulin is probably now going to be even more effective post-exercise, and it's just going to crash my blood sugar. So I know the pattern. So I anticipate rises or drops. So I suspend my insulin pump for another half an hour while I'm walking back home and preparing my meal. It's hard work, but it's not impossible. And if you care enough about your health, you'll do everything in your power. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it, it is just because you, when you don't have a, a pan- pancreas that functions, you have to basically <laughs> respond to everything it normally would, which is done for us automatically. And it's, just, I always use the sort of ex- example of if, if somebody told you you were in control of how fast you had to breathe. And every time you exercise, you had to remember to breathe harder. And every time, every time you're stressed out, you had to change your breathing. It's just, it can be very, it can be exhausting for a lot of people. And I think when you add in, uh, carbohydrates or significant amounts of carbohydrates, you just have this incredible challenge ahead of you. And I know guys like Dave Dykeman and others have talked about the difficulty in matching insulin dosage to carbohydrates. It, it, you almost never win with that approach and you're always either too high or too low. And occasionally you get lucky and you'll get it right. But now you're mostly getting it right. And once in a while you get it wrong. Like for instance, you say you don't typically, dinner, as you mentioned at the beginning of this little interview, that we shared dinner in the UK. We were sitting at the same table and having, I can't remember, it was a little bit of seafood, a little bit of meat. I remember it wasn't a big dinner, but it was good. But so how did you have to do, because that was not something you would normally do. So you had to change your routine for that, correct? Actually, I had very little. I don't know if anyone noticed. We were too busy chit-chatting. I I literally had very little to eat because I would have had to deal with blood sugar rises in the hotel room at night and just not ideal. So I had very little to eat. I think I had a small amount of the meat. It was lamb. I had the lamb, I think. That was the only thing I had. But And it wasn't a big portion. It was a small portion. And again, it wasn't ideal because I was out of my routine. My blood sugar was rising at night. So I woke up at 1 p.m., took a dose of insulin, then at 2 p.m. And I woke up with high blood sugars in the morning. But but that's a one-off. But having to do that every single day, I wouldn't do that every day. Yeah, fair enough. That's and and so like when you are out of, I don't know if you travel much, but it's one of those things where people. I just got back from out of town, and I like being home and having my own routine. Just irrespective of having diabetes or not, it's just having your own routine is 
you can manage things a little better. But what about, do you end up traveling much and do you have to make some serious concessions there? Yeah, we're frequent travelers and it's not ideal because every time we go somewhere and it's not short visits. For example, I'll be in, we're recording this now in June and I'll be in California in in August and I'll be there for three months. So usually it takes me a full week to 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 redesign my pump settings and to adjust them and because the weather would be different like i remember in california we were there for a lot for three months last year as well and the day starts early like we were up 5 p.m because all of the eastern coast was up and so you're 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 in the back wagon. So you have to, your day starts early. I noticed that. And that was quite a shock to the system. So I, I just had, I needed new sort of basal insulin or background insulin regimen to, to suit my sort of new life. So I actually have basal insulins, insulin sort of dosages or settings in my pump, one for the Middle East, one for the UK, one for California, one for Toronto. It, And it constantly needs adjusting. So, Yeah, good for you for doing that. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. I want to, you mentioned you have a group. How do people want to get a hold of you somehow? What's the best way to do that? The best way to do it is through the website because I have all my social media platforms on the website. And the website is lowcarbonfasting.com. Okay, lowcarbandfasting.com, and it's the word A-N-D spelled out, lowcarbandfasting.com, correct? All one word, L-O-W-A-N-D. Carb, low-carb fasting. Low-carb fasting, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's good seeing you again, and I wish you continued success and good luck. And like I said, we're I've interviewed quite a, quite a few type one day. I'm hoping to get Richard Bernstein on here to talk. I know he's getting up there in age and he, he, we're trying to get some, some of his insight because he's been doing this stuff forever and it'd be nice to see. So anyway, thank you so much. The rest of you folks, we will see you guys. I think later today, we have another one of these. I think when I have one of these this afternoon. So if you guys want to turn up for that, we'll be doing another one. Now, thank you so much. Have a great one. Appreciate it.